looking in the textbook. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so, they were very supportive. You know, they were very supportive. And um, they threw questions now and again, and it depended on the approach and the response to conviction. So it was it was quite um, challenging. Justice Mary C. It's an honor and privilege to have this conversation and spend some time with you. Your accomplishments over the last 35 years are quite extraordinary. Welcome, welcome to the African Women in Law Judicial Legacy Project. Thank you very much, Your Honor. You held that position on the high court for, I think, about five years, but then you resigned. Uh, and I read that you yes. resigned because you in, felt you encountered a lot of interference from the executive branch. Mm -hmm. What kind of resistance are you, were you talking about that you faced? It was um, because the, the, I'm sure you know about the background of the Commonwealth and the government during the past um, 22 years. Yes. So we got to a stage where, as far as I was concerned, there was no justice. There was, you know, blatant interference. You would deliver your judgment, and then you'll be called into the chief justice's chambers, where maybe you'll meet the attorney general from the ministry who had come over to complain about a decision that had gone against government, and they would force you sort of to try and, you know, rescind or change or whatever. So that was one particular type. So I stood my ground, and I said to them. I am not going to review any judgments or rulings that I've made because there's a court of appeal. If they are not happy, let them appeal to the appellate court, but you cannot use my court for me to now say I was wrong or I have now decided, no, I'm not going to do a review. So, you know, I, I, I faced a lot of um, opposition and I could see that I was being targeted and that was why I resigned because then I feared for my life because anything could have happened, you know? So this yeah. is it. Yeah, that, that standing up for the independence of the judiciary was a hallmark of your career. Thank you. I, I wanna I turn now, but that, that, even though that was something that it's like I like to call a door that was closed because mm -hmm. you closed the door on that because yeah. of principle. It did not close the door on the next aspect of your career, which I want to talk about, is your service internationally on international courts yeah. and international positions. You were appointed, I want to make sure I get it right, so I'm going to read this. You were, you were appointed by several international organizations such as the UN ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West, of West African States, and worked on the Comprehensive Peace Agreement for Liberia. You were a judicial monitor. You worked with the British Council and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Why were these appointments so important and what drew you to that international work? After I resigned, I thought to myself, the best and safest thing for me was to leave the jurisdiction. Meanwhile, I'd lost my husband in 2001, and I thought there was nothing left for me because my children were abroad. Uh, my son was in the US and my daughter was in the UK. Then I decided the only way I was going to be able to um, sponsor their causes that they were doing was to get an international job. I could have stayed here to go back to Euro practice, but I would have faced um, a lot of problems. And um, like I said, I didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So that's how I applied and got the first international job. And from then on, that was it. And when I went to Sierra Leone, um, I was appointed by the British Council um, under their DFID program. They had this um, under the um, Judicial Service, JSDP um, development program. So I worked for them for, from 2007 to 2010. And then there was a vacancy in the Commonwealth Secretariat and they wanted somebody to go to Swaziland. So I applied and I got the appointment and that's how I left in 2010 and went to Swaziland. 
where I worked as a high court judge. And I was in Swaziland from 2010 to 2012. And then a vacancy arose in Vanuatu in the South Pacific. And I saw the vacancy and I applied and I got the assignment. And that's how I was transferred from Swaziland to Vanuatu. And you were the first African woman to serve on that court, right? And I think yes. you were saying that you thought it was bad in Africa, but when you got there, it was worse. Tell us the where- The male dominance and- it was, Go ahead. It was, it was because I remember the first day I arrived um, in the court premises, you know, I just had this feeling, you know, when you have a feeling that you are being watched, you know, you cannot see the, the people, but you know, you are being watched. And when I finally entered the office, it was like, wow, it be woman, it's a woman, you know, because they've <laughs> never had a female. <laughs> they've never had a female before. And it's like, oh, you know, so this was it. So, and I was thinking, okay, that's why I said, I thought it was bad in Africa until I got to Vanuatu. There, it was just male dominance, everything, you know. The, the, the culture, customs and everything. I'm thinking, okay, am I going to survive this, you know? And the attitude of the men, you know, that was bad. So in, in but it was easy for me because in Africa, I'd already broken the barrier by joining the, 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 men, the men in Gambia. So it was in that part. So I just fitted in. I looked different, obviously, you know, with the photos, you'll see all the men and I was there in the middle. You know, it was <laughs> like I, I, the description that I use is like it just one single black eye being in, in, in a pot of rice, you know, just there in the middle there, you know. So sometimes you wonder, have these people, um, you know, taken me or have they accepted me just because they have no alternative or what is it? So again, I just delved in and started doing my best. And then the respect was there. It was so good that when um, the, um, there was a case, I, I'm sure you've read about it, the 14 MPs and the Yes, yeah, share corruption. that, tell us about that. Yes. Well, I was in my office this day and then the chief justice sent for me and then said, um, Justice C, I've got this case and um, I want you to you know, preside over it. So I said, which case are you talking about? Is it what has been reported in the papers? Because it was such a political thing. And he said, yes, I want you to preside over it for two reasons. One, being an international judge, we know you will be unbiased and you don't have any links or any ties to these people. Because of the culture and custom, everybody was sort of related. Just like in Africa, you know, you have all these second cousins and, you know, your neighbor, you cannot take a case against this person because this is your neighbor's sister or your neighbor's wife. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm giving this to you because I know you don't know any of them. You have no ties, no links to any of them. And I know you will give it your best. So I said, I will. And I took it on, but I didn't realize what I was taking on until they appeared before me. We were looking at the deputy prime minister we were looking at five ministers, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and we were looking at the speaker himself. And the arrogance, you know, when they came to court, it's like, you know, a woman. You know what I mean? Because when you don't respect women, I'm sorry to say this, but when you don't respect women, you don't expect anything good from that person. So it's like, oh, this would just be an easy ride. It's just a woman. And then she doesn't know anything about us, you know? Yeah. And when the first day, I still remember the first day when the registrar read out the charges and they had to take their plea, deliberately they chose to speak in Vanuatu Bishlama and in French. So we were dealing with three different interpretations. Luckily for me, I had a very good translator, you know, because it's their choice, whatever language they wanted to use. So we had to deal with Bishlama, then we had to, to translate into English, then we had to do it in French for the French speakers, because it's the three languages that they use in Vanuatu, you know. And then I had all sorts of threats. It was bad, because unlike in, in, in Gambia and in Sierra Leone, where we have court orderlies, we have security personnel, you know, guarding the house, you had drivers and everything. In Vanuatu, because it's just a small island, and everybody felt safe. 
We did not need any of that. But when this case came up, they had to provide me with security because the threats, and um, there was a time when they even went to parliament in the, in the middle of the night to try and get me deported. But as with everything, that leaked. So when it leaked, it made the papers early in the morning so they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And that saved me, you know, not to talk about their um, voodoos and their, you know, uh, DBM men that they brought and you could see them in the courts, but I was just doing my job, you know. On hindsight now, and um, the last time I was talking to my children and I said, you know what? When you are doing something and you are so convinced that you are doing the right thing, fear doesn't come into it. But now, if they ask me to go back, I won't. Because it's only after I finished, that's when I thought to myself, I could have been killed, I could have been kidnapped, anything could have happened to me. Because the, the, you know, there was so much um, aggressiveness, there was so much hatred, you know, it was bad. It was yeah, very bad. That, that, but that, I did my that. job. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I said I did my job and luckily for me, it, because it was the first time that somebody was tackling the corruption at the highest level. So the international press were involved. You had press from New Zealand, from Australia. The reporting was so good, so they couldn't touch me. I think that is what really you know, saved me and encouraged me to do what I had to do. Because the, the, the parliament was almost paralyzed because you had all these people <laughs> having been charged, you know, 14 of them. Mm. They were, you know, that that issue of courage, because you have been so courageous throughout your career, and the mm. way that you deal with fear, you know, a lot of women, you know, in the world, we know this, in the U.S., in, throughout the world, women are still not in their rightful position. We've made a lot of accomplishments, and we you know, but we are still dealing with male chauvinism, with not getting all the opportunities we should be entitled to. And women are being harassed and, and there is fear that the community feels. How did you, uh, you just said you kept going. And so that's how you found the courage to carry on? Yes, indeed, I kept going. And what helped me was the fact that my family members were not with me. I was alone. Because it's always easy if you need to escape, if you're alone, that when you have to think about going with your children and your grandchildren or whatever. So, you know, and, um, and it was always easy for me to be able to sort of um, just lock myself in, which is what I did. I just, you know, made sure it was home to office and that was it. My life just changed because, you know, you dared not go anywhere. I was an African and I stood out, you know, like a sore thumb. You were saying that your life changed drastically uh, because you just went to the courthouse and you came home, that you stood out like a sore thumb because you were an African and, and you were alone. So that's how you were able to handle it. And I wanted to say the other thing that strikes me about you is that you're very strategic. You know, that you have a strategy when you are in a difficult situation of how to get you through. Why is strategic thinking so important? I believe it's important because if not, you do not, um, you, you always have to protect your back literally speaking. So you need to strategize. So the way I saw it, make sure that you do not appear in public unnecessarily, you know, unless it was necessary going to the supermarket or the market to pick up stuff, then going to the office and then coming home. So it would have been easy to locate me if I had gone missing, then they would have known, you see, this is it. And then I made sure that I kept in touch with my my son, who by then was in Denmark, and my daughter in the UK. And he would always call to say, Mom, are you OK? What's happening now? What's the latest? You know, it was very important. And I just kept a low profile. 
Because the other thing, again, that bothered me is the fact that somebody would come and engage you in something that you thought was an innocent conversation. But meanwhile, you are being recorded. And I didn't want any of that. I didn't want any leakage at all during all the, the um, court proceedings. So I made sure I spoke to nobody. It was difficult, you know, it was difficult. But the way I saw it, I felt safer. So it was good that I, you know, strategized in a way that kept me safe. And, and you've used strategic thinking so much, you know, in terms of when you first became a high court judge, when you took these other positions, your strategy was always to perform at the highest level, to work hard, to do whatever was necessary to change the attitude of those who felt you were not competent for the job. Exactly, exactly. Yes, I think you've summarized it very well. Okay. You know, and, I always so, wanted to show them that I could do it. No matter what your thoughts were, I could do it. And what a man has done, a woman can do. You know, just give us the opportunity. I'm not a female activist per se, but I'm just thinking this idea of, um, well, you know, women, you know, you have other things, you have family matters, so you'll be confused. No, when it comes to work, it's work. If it means staying up all night to write a very good judgment, I will do it. But that doesn't mean I won't take care of family matters, you know? So this was it. So I think you're right about strategizing, yeah. Yes, it's just to encourage them because the way I look at it, if I had not got that encouragement, I would not have been where I am today. You know, I'm not more educated than all these people. I've just been blessed. So when you've been blessed, you, you appreciate what God has given to you and you don't misuse it. You know, this is it. Yes. Why, why is it so important for a judge to not just wear the black robe, but to be engaged in the community 